there's this third kind of level of events, which we call catastrophes, which exceed the resources available at the state level for sure, but also you start seeing a breakdown at the federal level in the US context, and you start seeing the response break apart, needs not being met for extended periods of time. And if you think back to the similarities between the response in New Orleans and Puerto Rico and with COVID across the country, you can start to see where the breakdowns were happening more at the federal level. Welcome back to The Response, where we explore how communities are building collective resilience in the wake of disasters, from hurricanes to wildfires to reactionary politics and more. I'm your host, Tom Llewellyn. It's a new year, and with it comes the beginning of our sixth season. In the coming months, you'll notice a few changes to the response, as new guest co-hosts join me to cover familiar and some not-so-familiar topics for this show. You may also notice that we're going back to an earlier format, with episodes running for closer to 30 minutes rather than an hour. If you have feedback about the new changes, or about the show in general, please let us know by leaving a comment on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube, tagging us on Twitter or Instagram at Response Podcast, or sending an email to the response at shareable.net. Today, we're featuring a conversation with noted disasterologist and previous guest, Samantha Montano. We discuss the impact of climate change on disasters and the need for better disaster management and planning. We also explore the difference between emergencies, disasters, and catastrophes, and highlight the importance of community involvement in all stages of disaster management. We'll wrap things up with a review of recent changes to FEMA's individual assistance program and touch on the role of journalism in bridging the gap between public expectations and government actions in disaster response. Now, let's get to the interview. Hey, Samantha, thanks so much for coming back on The Response. Yeah, good to be here. A lot of things have changed since the last time you were a guest back in 2019. And also at the same time, a lot of the same structural issues related to pretty much every stage of the disaster management cycle remain the same with a little bit of improvements around the edges. But as we've seen from last year, some of the main issues that arise during and, and after a disaster that have been plaguing uh, the United States, but globally for many years, reared their ugly heads once again. And that was within the context of what's been heavily reported now as 2023 having been the hottest year on record. And I'm wondering if you can just start by unpacking a little bit about what that actually means tangibly, what impact those higher temperatures had on the climate last year and on disasters in general. As we start to see the climate changing, we are seeing that there is a increase in disasters in terms of their severity, the costs associated with them. And so last year was another year in the past several where we've seen higher temperatures, we've seen changes to hurricanes, changes to the conditions that facilitate wildfires. And at the end of the year, the tally from NOAA was that we had $25 billion disasters last year. So again, in the trajectory of where we're going with the climate crisis, we were right on track. Those disasters really seem like they were many fold. Here in the Western United States, we were fortunate to have a, a pretty mild wildfire season. And um, there was actually not the as bad of a hurricane season as we've had in, in many years recently as well, but there was still uh, quite a bit of severe storms and flooding, um, which caused, the, I think, the majority of those major disasters in the U.S. That's one of the other things that I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about is about that diversity of disasters. There's the regional impacts, but then also it seems like there's disaster cycles where depending on various patterns, you get similar types of disasters across regions from year to year. One thing that's important to remember when we talk about climate change is that climate change doesn't mean that every year we're going to have X number more hurricanes or more intense hurricanes. What we're dealing with are averages. Some years, it'll be a pretty easy hurricane season and there may not really be too much that happens, which is great. Or like you said, a, a cooler wildfire season for the U.S. West Coast. 
And then other years, it'll be the opposite of that. And so to your point, last year, we had the fire on Maui. We had some kind of standout events in, in that sense. But we also just had a lot of smaller, no-name rain events and tornadoes and other types of severe storms that led to a lot of damage across the country, um, but didn't necessarily capture the same kind of media attention that you might see with something like a hurricane. You mentioned 25. I'd also read maybe as many as 28 uh, billion dollar disasters. So at the end of the year, it takes them a while to actually tally it all up. It'll be a couple over 25. Yeah. I think now they've said it's the most billion dollar disasters mm -hmm. counting for inflation that the mm -hmm. United States has ever seen. and. This is up from, I think it was 2017 previously was the highest number of those. And so we're going through these kind of cycles, but I think even that, w what we mean by a billion dollar disaster, the levels of disaster can be deceiving, especially when you break it down to a billion dollar or more, we can have a hundred billion dollar disaster, you know, Katrina hitting New Orleans or Hurricane Maria hitting Puerto Rico. And sometimes those things are lumped together, right? And it, it's hard to understand the severity of those. And I know that you first got turned on to kind of disaster thinking about this and caring because of your experience going to New Orleans after Katrina. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the kind of difference between a major disaster and now what disaster researchers, including yourself, are uh, focusing on as ca uh, catastrophes and w what that difference looks and feels like. This is a, a really important point. It's absolutely true that last year we broke that billion dollar record in the US, but we actually did not have a catastrophic event last year. In the past 20 years in the US, we've had three events that I would consider to be a catastrophe. We had Katrina in 2005, we had Hurricane Maria in 2017 in Puerto Rico, and then the COVID pandemic, of course, to the extent it's still continuing. We had that last year. The way that we approach this from research is when you look at this full spectrum of events, we have emergencies on the low end, which are events that may capture national attention, but the way that we actually respond to them and deal with those life-saving measures are handled at the local level, using local resources. We're not really having to send in the cavalry, so to speak, to address the needs that arise from that event. So things like a mass shooting, for example, many of these flood events, even though we were mentioning before, would fall into that category. Then in the middle, we have disasters. When you have an event where you do need that outside help to come in and that local resources are overwhelmed. So the fire on Maui would be a good example of that from last year. Looking back, the Joplin tornado would be a classic. Even something like the BP oil disaster would fall into that category. So within there, there's still quite a range of what those events look like. But then there's this third level of events, which we call catastrophes, which exceed the resources available at the state level for sure, but also start you start seeing a breakdown at the federal level in the U.S. context, and you start seeing the response break apart, needs not being met for extended periods of time. And if you think back to the similarities between the response in New Orleans and Puerto Rico and with COVID across the country, you can start to see where the breakdowns were happening more at the federal level. That is one way to think about this range of events that we're having to deal with. And the reason that's important is because there are all of these kind of implications for how we plan for those different types of events, right? Like the way we plan for an emergency is going to be different than the way we try and plan for a catastrophe. And you feel like it's actually possible to plan for those catastrophes in advance? Planning is always going to have its limitations, of course. There's always a moment I tell my students where we have to throw the plans out the window because it's just not going to work for the situation that we have. But I do think that there is a lot more that we could be doing to ready ourselves to deal with catastrophic events. If you look at, I won't get into the details here, but if you look at our national emergency management policy, the vast majority of it is not relevant to catastrophes. It's written for disasters, which that's what we're dealing with most. So that makes sense. But we know we've had three in the past 20 years. We know catastrophes are possible. 
we know this is something that we have to deal with. Obviously, the impacts of catastrophes are immense. And from research and from our experience with those events, we have a lot of insights that could be integrated into policy to better enable not just the federal government, but local and state governments and other kind of stakeholders involved to ready ourselves for those bigger events. On the response, we've done a fair bit of coverage of Hurricane Maria and Puerto Rico's recovery and also throughout the pandemic. But we haven't dug that deep into Katrina, which is one of the other things I wanted to talk to you about because you talk about it extensively in your book, which I've been listening to. And it was such a key moment in your personal development and and leading to your work. And so looking at Katrina as a catastrophe and just to stay on this thought around preparedness, in hindsight, what do you think were some of the things that Louisiana, New Orleans, we could say specifically, but the the region as a whole could have done to be better prepared for the natural hazard that turned into a disaster that ended up leading to a catastrophe. I think it's a very long list. I think maybe it's most useful to think about this from a systems perspective. Something that is really important to understand in terms of the context of why the response to Katrina unfolded in such a spectacularly terrible way is that there had been very recent, two years before Katrina, massive overhaul of national emergency management policy in the wake of 9-11, related to the creation of the Department of Homeland Security. And those changes had a massive effect on the overall U.S. emergency management system. And unfortunately, those changes, some of them were not great changes, and some of them also had not had time to fully be implemented by the time Katrina hit. And so it was just really particularly bad timing. Part of the reason you see such a breakdown in the federal response is that the system had just been shuffled all around and people didn't really understand, are we doing this the old way? Are we doing it the new way? Who's in charge of what? There was an extended period of time where the folks at the higher levels didn't know who was in charge of the response, whether it was Michael Brown as the head of FEMA, or if it was the secretary of DHS, or if it was the president, or who was even in charge, right? Um, Those are the kinds of things that should not be a question in the middle of a response. And since Katrina, we have tried to work on this a bit, but there's still moments where sometimes it's not always clear in a response of who is in charge. Those are the kinds of things that we actually completely are capable of addressing ahead of time. There are obvious things that could have a huge effect. Mm -hmm. That question of, one, what the protocol is, what the roles are, I think is mm-hmm. is an interesting one, especially as there's a can be pushback from having outside federal agencies come into various communities, especially when it comes to immigrant communities where there may be undocumented folks, people of color. Mm-hmm. And, and we saw some of those uh, negative effects, which you write about in your book, in the immediate aftermath of Katrina as well. The way that those that were most impacted were often seen through a a lens of criminality or an othering that took place with that. Just before I move on from this specific example, can you just talk about that aspect of emergency management response and what that relationship is between outside agencies coming in and working to support local communities with all of the nuances that exist? One of the main responsibilities of emergency managers is to ensure that all members of a community are represented in emergency management, that their needs are accounted for, that they have a voice in how emergency management is playing out in their community. And unfortunately, sometimes that does not happen in local communities for a variety of reasons. And 
there are all kinds of consequences when that doesn't happen. You have this kind of us versus them mentality sometimes that can emerge. You have decades, sometimes centuries of social problems that have been boiling in the background come to a head in the midst of a disaster. You have the repercussions of systemic racism and classism that help to manifest these differences in impacts and who is able to get resources. And this can all come together in the midst of a response and create a whole nother layer of challenges for folks that are trying to address the needs of that community. And so that is something that I think is really important for emergency management agencies to be working with ahead of time. There's been a mentality, I think, or a perception sometimes that emergency managers are uh, first responders and falling into that sector of work. Mm -hmm. And I don't really think that's the right way to think about what that job is. It's really much more about community organizing and getting the community together, getting them on board, getting community buy-in for various projects, helping the community understand the complexities of risk. In some places, you're starting to see a little bit of a shift in thinking among emergency management. But I think moving forward, that is a really critical path that we need to be going down. You've talked about this before, and I think this ended up leading to the recent op-ed you wrote for the New York Times, which is that what the public wants from government in a disaster is different from what the government actually does in a disaster. And that mismatch of expectations is a fundamental tension between the emergency management uh, that the field seems to have no intention of addressing. And so you wrote that earlier last year and then led to the op-ed. And I'm wondering if there's other things that you feel can address that mismatch and that could be done to bridge the gap between those expectations. I actually think the key group of people here who can actually really bridge this gap is journalists. The public doesn't understand how the emergency management system is set up. Even if you have been through a disaster, you still really only understand it from your perspective, which might be useful to understand some problems, but you still don't necessarily have a big picture of how the system works or how it's supposed to work. It took me years of intentionally studying this to even begin to understand how this system works, right? So of course the average person isn't going to understand that. I think we have a lot of ideas about what government does in a disaster, what they don't do. And for some communities, we expect, well, FEMA's going to show up. They're going to hand us a check. I pay my taxes. This is why we have government is to help us in the midst of crisis. And then when that doesn't happen, they're like, wait, what? This is so shocking to us. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have communities where government has not historically showed up for them. And so they are less surprised by that. And then you have the emergency management system and like the government part of that system in the middle here doing some things and helping some people in some very particular ways. But then also leaving all of these needs unmet in communities across the country and the theory had always been that nonprofits and mutual aid groups would fill those gaps, but we've seen that they have their limitations in terms of what resources they have and how well they're able to meet those needs. And so you, you see this mismatch going on and this just complete kind of talking over each other and misunderstanding each side of things. I think part of what needs to happen here is that there does need to be better education for the public about the emergency management system. And I don't think that we all need to understand every single emergency management policy, but I do think some helpful explainers would be really useful here on just some of these basic points and even just having more than a handful of journalists across the country who actually understand what the declaration process is or how individual assistance works so that they make sure they are writing about that in an accurate way in their articles could potentially make a really huge difference. On the other hand, too, I think government here needs to take some responsibility for this. I think that they need to be listening to what the public is saying, which is we want more help when disasters happen. Government is there to serve us, theoretically, so they should be making changes to the extent within their legal bounds to make sure that they are effectively and equitably using the resources that they do have to do a better job of meeting that 
range of needs that people have after a disaster. It's tough because obviously journalism (laughs) across the country is breaking down, but I do think they are in a very unique position to be able to address that need. There's a number of major news outlets out there and TV news and everything else that really should be providing more resources that knowing that there are so many of these disasters. Last year, we had the, the most $1 billion dollar disasters there have been. Like clearly, uh, there is a, a need for that kind of information. And when one is going through a disaster, it is you know very hard to, one, deal with the initial implications, the roof's been ripped off, what's happened, and then have to figure out where and how to find where and how to find information even about how to apply or how to go through that process. And this is something personally I went through last year where I was a disaster zone and we had four branches come through our roof. Others take out a deck and significant damages. And the only reason why I even found out that there was some amount of potential support was because I happened to go to the library because I'd lost power. And they had in the back room with the library, you had to go through a separate entrance. They had a whole area where they were taking people in. And I thought, I'll pop in and just see what's going on. But unless I had already been going to the library, I would have had no idea that there was services. And I almost missed the deadline date because they were just about to wrap up. So there's a number of improvements that need to be made there. And it sounds like maybe there's some a little bit of good news on that front with FEMA just announcing that they're going to be making changes to the individual assistance program. And I'm wondering if you can talk about what that looks like, what some of those key changes are, and how that will support people that are going through disasters. There have, for many years, been criticisms of FEMA's individual assistance programs. And those are the programs that exist to give aid directly from FEMA to individuals, as opposed to paying for things like fixing roads and bridges. And so FEMA gives out money in very specific situations, right? This is not every time there is a storm. You have to be in a county that received a declaration, received approval for it. There's a lot of hoops that you have to jump through to even begin to be eligible for this money. But nonetheless, there are millions of people across the country every year who are eligible for this aid. And what we've heard from survivors constantly for, again, many years, is that even knowing this aid exists, let alone figuring out the process to receive this aid, is like solving a Rubik's Cube. It can be done, but it's really hard if no one has told you how to do it. And I've written a lot about this. And as you mentioned, a couple of days ago, FEMA announced that they were making some pretty significant changes to individual assistance to address some of these most common problems. Probably the biggest change from a financial impact for individuals, survivors, is that they are going to change the rules so insurance will not count towards the amount of money you can receive from FEMA. So there's a cap every year of like how much a person can receive from FEMA. This year it's $41,500. So if you had some insurance money In the past, they would have counted that towards your $41,000. They are no longer going to do that, apparently. So that means if insurance only gives you $10,000, but you need $20,000 or $50,000, you can go get the rest from FEMA. Again, theoretically, if you meet all these other requirements. So that, I think, has the potential to mean a fair amount more money for homeowners. So I think that is really good. And I think just being here in California last year when we had that disaster and we had all that impact to our home, which just the the timing of the whole thing, the the first branch came to the roof the day after we cleared the sale of, mm. of the house. It was just immediate. But because we're in California and there's issues around insurance companies that have already been leaving the state and threatening to leave the state and policies getting terminated, we were afraid to make an insurance claim. Mm -hmm. And uh, because we had not made an insurance claim, FEMA was unwilling to actually give us any money. So we ended up just getting loans to be able Mm -hmm. to do this. And because we weren't able to cover the cost of of fixing the roof and everything, 
all by itself, but because there was this fear around the loss of insurance. So it seems like another one of those things is that they're going to make it so you no longer have to go to insurance first. In certain cases, I thought I read as well. That might be buried in there. I, I might have missed it. I know that you don't have to go to SBA first anymore. Gotcha. It's like a kind of a similar hoop that people were having to jump through, which is you were having to go to the small business administration and apply for a loan, which for some people, they were like, I'm not going to be able to pay this back. I don't want to take a loan out. And then other people were just doing it as a box checking thing, right? I just have to go get denied and then I can come back to FEMA. So it was just adding more layers there and more frustration and then also confusion because it's the name of the administration it throws everyone off. There's some relatively minor changes like that where it doesn't sound like a huge deal, but I think it will help facilitate more people being able to access aid. The trick with all of this, though, is that it all depends on how this is implemented in practice. And that is something that we just have to wait and see on. But if you read through the full press release of changes, all of the changes in there, I thought were positive changes. There wasn't anything in there that I thought was bad. There's some potential consequences to some of these things, but I think we can manage them. But it all comes down to, well, how useful is this change actually going to be once we roll it out in a disaster? And for that, we have to wait and see. Going back to the insurance thing, I do think, again, because that is the big one, I think part of that also is I'm viewing that as FEMA's attempt at a Band-Aid over the insurance situation across the country right now. There's not much that FEMA can do on their own to force insurers to stay in states or to deal with the accountability issue of insurance companies not actually paying out as much as they should be. So I think this was FEMA's attempt to try and do what they, was in their power to address this problem until broader insurance reforms hopefully come to fruition at some point. Here in California, one of the things might, or at least my limited understanding is that it's grandstanding by the insurance companies because they're in a battle with the state regulators mm -hmm. around the amount that they can charge uh, for right. premiums and, and for per when a claim is made. And, right. and so like you're saying, it's not necessarily a federal thing at this point in time, but it's a state thing mm -hmm. but it's squeezing out a lot of people and the impact is real for many as we have more and more disasters the fear of not being able to get insurance and being underinsured is going to have some pretty significant ramifications for society as a whole we've seen when people lose their homes and can't move back to a place and and aren't able to be part of what that kind of reimagining and rebuilding uh looks like we've been talking a lot about kind of the the national government side of things, emergency management, FEMA, all of that. But we've yet to jump into kind of what it takes to build more collective resilience within our communities. And I'm wondering if there's a couple of things still staying on kind of the recovery, uh, response recovery side, but are there things that communities can do to be better prepared, be organized for when a disaster happens, not just to support themselves in the immediate aftermath, but to be better prepared as a community to navigate things like FEMA funding and what that recovery looks like. There definitely are a lot of things that we could be doing. So one of the major things is doing recovery planning before a disaster ever even happens. So one thing that we know from research is when communities have a pre-existing recovery plan, they're able to move through that recovery process more quickly, right? Because they've already thought about what are the areas of our community that we need to prioritize getting fixed? What changes do we maybe want to implement? Since everything's broken, we're going to change things as we rebuild. So they've already negotiated out some of those bigger questions. You then have a group of people in your community who have already been thinking about recovery and have a better chance of potentially being able to navigate that recovery process. So Recovery planning is something that local emergency management agencies can do, some of them do, but it's also something that community organizations can take on or even like a city planning office, right? There's like other people in your community that could be really engaged in that process and obviously as many people and groups as possible who work on that, the better. The other thing that I would say is organizing for 
more investment in your local emergency management agencies. So most communities across the country only have a part-time emergency manager. When you have a part-time emergency manager, it's probably unlikely that they are an expert in recovery. They're probably lean more towards the response side of things, um, which is obviously important, but you really, I think of it this way that every emergency management agency needs at least four people, one for each phase of the disaster. And so to have a dedicated recovery person in your emergency management agency is a huge deal. And so from a community organizing perspective, advocating for more funding for that agency, so you can actually hire somebody to be in that position is really important. And then existing groups that are in your community tend to evolve into disaster groups once something happens, right? So if there's any kind of like outreach to be done uh, among just any existing nonprofits or existing groups in your community ahead of time to just even get them oriented towards thinking about, hey, this might be your role if we get into the situation of being in a response or a recovery, I think is really useful. I've been asking a lot of guests this recently with everything going on in the world politically and socially and also environmentally, where do you find joy? What still excites you despite everything else that's going on? My answer for this tends to be my students. So I am a professor in an undergrad emergency management program outside of Boston, and I have 200 plus students who are all disaster nerds and wanting to be involved in disasters and do climate change related work for their entire careers. They're walking into very daunting fields for sure, but a lot of them have really good ideas and cool ideas and are really excited to get started in on this work, seeing their willingness to jump into (laughs) this fight with us is something that keeps me going. Thank you so much for sharing that. And where can people find your work and follow you? Probably the best place is on Twitter. It's at Sam L. Montano, M-O-N-T-A-N-O. And then you can also find links to my books and articles and all of this kind of stuff that we were talking about on my website, which is disaster-ology.com. Just for listeners, highly recommend subscribing to Samantha's Substack, Disasterology, where you put out a kind of monthly newsletter that summarizes a number of things that have happened in the disaster world and where you can find a full breakdown of the announced changes to FEMA's most recent kind of individual assistance program upgrades. Thank you so much and hope to talk to you again in the future and we'll follow you in the interweb till then. Perfect. You've been listening to a conversation with Samantha Montano. Please check the show notes for links for all the resources mentioned in today's show. The response is edited by Paige Kelly and hosted by me, Tom Llewellyn. Operations and funding support were provided by Allison Huff and Bobby Jones. The response's theme music, Life When I'm Free, was written by Cultivate Beats. Support for this show has been provided by the Shift Foundation, Platform OS, and contributions from listeners like you. The response is a project of Shareable, an award-winning nonprofit media outlet and action network promoting people-powered solutions for the common good. Please support us by rating and reviewing The Response wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram, at Response Podcast, and share the show with others. We always ask you to do these three things because they go a really long way in helping us extend our reach. Till next time, take care of each other.